Junk said, I'm going to uh, uh, give my second lecture today, and I'm going to tie it together with uh, work on, on social class from last week, and then make a bridge into uh, the final lecture on next Monday. So I'm going to start with what does it take to thrive in the multicultural world? And the multicultural world is a fact. We, it's a fact on the ground. It means that we're going to have to bridge a whole variety of divides that are, that are out there. And to do that, we first need to be aware of those sociocultural divides, recognize them. What I'm going to say today is um, a root cause of many, many of the everyday tensions between genders, between ethnicities, between races, between social classes, et cetera, um, is the clash between the values and practices of independence and those of interdependence. And those of you who are here last week know what I'm talking about, but I'll say about, about some more about it today. Um, and what you also need to bridge divides is to recognize the independence divide. I've got that in blue, and I've got, tried to color code blue all the way through when I'm talking about independence. The independence that characterizes most of our mainstream cultures and also characterizes psychology, and not just psychology, all of the social sciences. So there's an there's a independence bias built right into it. And so we have to um, understand that as we start bridging divides. And then finally, we have to start fostering the understanding and the accommodation of interdependence. And interdependence is what's characteristic of so many of the cultural contexts that we haven't paid uh, as much attention to, that we don't understand, and that we need to in order to make an effective multicultural world in which we have a hope of thriving. And that's good for promoting equity and also for enhancing individual motivation, creativity, well-being. So that's the sort of um, roadmap of where I'm going. And I'm going to um, talk about two divides today, two types of divides. I'm going to talk about one uh, ethnic divide and one and a gender divide. And then I'm going to circle back to social class and then uh, talk about how to bridge those divides and set that up for, for next week. So let me start by um, posing a little dilemma for you. You come home from work one day, and you discover that your house is on fire. I'm sorry, um, but inside, your mother is asleep in one bedroom, and your spouse is asleep in another bedroom. You've only time to save one of them. Which one would you save? Now, just think about it for a minute. I'm going to ask for a show of hands. I want to see. Let's see. We've got at least one, <laughs> one couple, one couple in this room. So, <laughs> oh, okay. All right, couple, cu oh, more, oh, ma many couples. All right, couples, you got, you are exempt from this question. <laughs> but those of the rest of you, uh, the people who aren't couples in this room, um, tell me. Um, let's so say, show a save, of, show of hands. How many here would save their mother? Mother, mother, raise your hands. One, two, three. OK, we've got about mm, maybe, maybe a quarter. Uh, let's save their mother. <laughs> he drank his. OK, let me see a show of hands of how many, how many would save their spouse? Their spouse. Come on, you don't have, it's, it's OK. It's just a hypothetical dilemma. OK, we've got more. We've got pretty good. OK, we've got more people. Um, saying definitely, I think about twice as many saying as they would save their spouse. Um, let me show you um, the data from one of the um, many uh, studies in this. It was Wu and colleagues' um, recent study. So you can see that the responses in this room were like the typical American responses over here on the left, in which most people say they would save their spouse. And this is a multi-study uh, study. Uh, experiment with, with many different ages and all sorts of things going on. But I'm just showing you one here. Most say they would save their spouse. And when you ask the Americans why would they save their spouse, they say, well, it's obvious. My spouse, my spouse is my soulmate. I chose my spouse. It's my preference. This is the person that I decided and made a choice to spend my life with this person. Of course, I would um, save my spouse. And so then you ask the Taiwanese, well, 
Why do you give a very different answer? Why do you say that you would choose your mother? And so the Taiwanese say, well, it's obvious. Your mother is a parent. Your parents gave you life. Everything begins with your parents. And it's your duty to, to honor your parents and to your place in this larger hierarchy that you were a part of. Your parents come first, and you're here because of them. It's an obvious answer. And they say, you know, you can always get another spouse. <laughs> <laughs> only, one, only one mother. That's the beginning of everything. So true. <laughs> I, heard, I heard that. <laughs> but, um, so you know, it, you are from um, an, an East Asian perspective perspective. You're, you're obligated to your parents. Um, you are interdependent with them. You begin with them, and they are interdependent with you. Um, as an adult, you need to save them from fire, and that's your duty. And as you're, when you're a um, child to those parents, you need to do what you can to honor them, fulfill their expectations in all kinds of other ways that we'll get to, including being a very good student and becoming an educated person. So, okay, what's the, what's the story here? Why so different? One, one important factor is the models of agency or models of self that are organizing and that are, uh, that structure the cultures in the two places. And these models of agency aren't just attitudes in people's heads. They're reflected all through the culture. And I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. But first, let me just give you, um, set these two up. And once again, it's a bit of a review for people who were here last week. What's different here? You see the self, the middle circle in both cases. And you see that middle circle is surrounded by others. Because of course, as social psychologists, we know that we do everything because of others. You know, We are social beings. But what's different between these two models is what's the relationship between the self and others. And what you can see over here on the independent self side is that there's a, there's a boundary, a uh, sharp boundary between self and others. Because very often, you're concerned with trying to not let others influence you too much. Your control of others and their influences, you're not always, they shouldn't be pushing you around. What matters is what's inside the blue, is your preferences, your interests, what, what you like to do, your passion. That's what should guide behavior. That's what should drive the bus in an independent model of self. And there's various other um, features that are sort of, um, that I've spelled out there that you can see. You know, there's a focus on being unique, there's a focus on on um, being free to choose to express your preferences and trying to influence other people, free from tradition, history, and place. You can see this is a very um, American idea of self and, of course, equal to others. Over here on the interdependent self, what you see is important, what's is highlighted in the red here, this is relationships with others. This is a self that understands one's place in a larger encompassing social whole, understands one's place in the hierarchy, understands where where you have come from, who you're tied to, who you're obligated to, what roles you have, what obligations you have. And there's a different understanding of others. There's a more positive construal of others and others' role in your behavior, in, in your life. And so there's sort of less tension with respect to um, in-group others there. There's more, there's more positivity there, more uh, acceptance of the idea that others are part of you and you need to um, fulfill your duties and obligations, meet their expectations, and, uh, and they yours. So these um, two models that are out there in our world, in our multicultural world, that it can lead to clashes between us, can really uh, create problems across various divides if we don't understand that these are two different models, ways of being in the world, two different ways of setting up cultures and organizing cultures. You can have miscommunication, misunderstanding, conflicts of all sorts. What I want to suggest broadly, boldly, that to the extent that we understand these as two ways of being, we can put them together in our multicultural worlds. We can make room for them. We can accommodate for these two ways of being 
Both of these are, are good, viable, important ways of being. We can bring them together in our various spaces. It's going to take a lot of effort and a lot of stepping on eggshells and a little bit of a lot of, oh, I'm so tired of accommodating and having to worry about this and that and another thing and saying my pronouns and all the things that we would rather not think about. We're going to have to think about those things all the time. But if we can think about them and understand why they might be important, we can um, have you know, better motivation, productivity, creativity, well-being, all these things. And most importantly, we can possibly begin to bridge divides, fit these two ways of being into one world, and potentially um, make room for both of them in the world and potentially not blow each other up. Um, this is the, I, what I'm going to talk about today comes from a book that I did with my um, former student and colleague, Elena Connor. And we um, talk about eight different divides in this, in this book, ones in which there's um, enough research to make the claim that the divides have a great deal to do with differences between independence and interdependence. Of course, those aren't the only differences that are out there, but they're ones that are, that, um, are critical. So we talk about it as a root cause, not the. Now, where do these in independent and interdependent models or theories of the self and agency, where do they come from? As I said before, they're not just in our heads. They're in our worlds. And as we go through those worlds, saturated and structured according to those models, we get one way of being or another. And cultures, I define simply here as the ideas, institutions, interactions that guide individuals in thinking, feeling, and acting. Many, many different definitions of culture out there. This is just a simple one. It's four eyes. And they fit together into a dynamic that we've called the culture cycle. And uh, you see these uh, four layers or levels. And there's a few things that I want to point out. First of all, this is meant to imply constant change. Cultures are never static. Um, they're all, always changing. And the, one of the most important reasons that is is because the individual thoughts, feelings, mindsets, biases, brain, everything we usually study right here is, is part of the culture, not separate from the culture. We often try to cast the individual as separate from the culture. The individual is part of this culture. And individual behaviors feed back into that culture at all times. And in fact, cultures are products of human agency. They're not s separate. We, we, we have made them, maybe not us individually right now, have made you know, the various institutions and um, you know, the various uh, capitalist system that we're living in. But certainly, people like us made those systems. They structured those systems. They're a result of human structuring. And that means, the good news is about this way of thinking, is that we can change those various features of our cultures. Some features are um, easier to change than others. But of course, our individual behavior, where we're usually focused as psychologists, is pretty much um, unfolds through our daily interactions at the next level, through at home, at school, in workplaces, in, in places of worship. So that's organizing our behavior. And those interactions are themselves structured and given form by larger institutions that make up the, the society, government, schools, media, religion, our, our market systems. And all of those things are underpinned and saturated by these ideas about what's, what's good, what really matters in the world. And when you're talking about American cultural context, you know, there's so many of those ideas. But we would say freedom. We would say choice. We would say equality. We would say self-expression. We would say self-assertion or self-promotion. These are ideas that are very important in American mainstream culture. So those ideas are um, animating all of our institutions and our interactions and giving rise to our ideas. So some of our cultural context, and these are just some, I have nine here, uh, promote independence. And you can think about what those are. And I'm going to ask you to uh, have some fun for a minute and pass around these score sheets. And some, here, I'll, pa I'll go this way. Will you go? OK. I think that's enough. You can see those. And some of them promote interdependence. Okay. And this is um, based on 
compiling research across hundreds of studies in many social sciences, economics, sociology, um, anthropology, suggests that those cultures over here in blue down on the left-hand side are those that promote this independent model of agency or being, and those on the right tend to promote more interdependent. Now, does everybody have a score sheet? I want you to just need some more. Just take a minute and fill it out, but be sure to read the instructions because what I want you to see is that you can be both. You don't have to just, uh, no binary here. No binaries are being observed. Oh, here, okay. Hi. I'll just grab onto one of them. So it says, you mark a one if you've highly interacted with or identify with that culture. So for me, I'm obviously not um, East Asian by family background, but I spent a lot of time in East Asia. So I'd give myself a one for East, and I'd give myself a one for West, because I've highly interacted with those cultural contexts. The same with gender. I identify as a woman, but I spent a lot of my time in spaces that are um, dominated by men. Then, well, you, then you have to decide. Oh. You don't have to do anything. Oh. Would you like one, Mike? You don't have one. Gotta get your, oh. Does anyone else need one? I have four. Does anyone else need a score sheet? <laughs> I'm just going to give you a couple minutes. It's as we say. Here's some other ones. Raise your hand if you need one. Here. What should I do? Don't touch it. He wants one in the green. I think it's because it's moving. Sorry, that's annoying with the feedback. It does. Can you hear it now? Is that better? Can you hear me? Okay. I think it needs to be on this as well, otherwise it's floppy and it moves. That's better, I think. Yeah. Okay. Is that better now? You can hear me? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm going to um, ask for, I want you to, did you total them at the bottom? Because I'm going to ask for your scores. I want to see a show of hands of the people who have a higher score on independence than on interdependence. Higher score on independence. Okay, look around. Look around so you can see. It looks like the majority of the room, including <laughs> Heejun, <laughs> has a, a higher score on independence. Okay, let me say, okay, hands down. Let me see a, a show of hands of anybody who has a higher score on interdependence. Oh, well, I get there. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. Raise your hands. The interdependents they have their hands like this, you know. Okay. So we have three. Four, we have four or five have a higher score at interdependence. Okay. Let me see a show of hands of people who are reasonably balanced. On. Okay. Now I will. Okay. Well, that's interesting. So I would suggest, and we can test it out. These are people that are going to do well in the multicultural world because they've already had some reasonable amount of experience in both kinds of contexts. And of course, you know, interdependence, East Asian style is not interdependence 
um, being a woman in the US style or being working class or being black in the US, but there are some commonalities across these ones. Um, and what the commonality has to do with is social responsiveness. If, if, if you've had some practice and familiarity with these contexts on the right hand side, chances are you will have had more practice being tuned in and responsive to other people, being aware of yourself in, in various social hierarchies, what your place is in some encompassing social whole, and with paying attention to roles and responsibilities and obligations. More focus, more practice on that than if you haven't um, spent any time in these kinds of contexts. And so I just thank you for um, carrying out that exercise. What I wanted you to take away with from that is a number of things. First is that everyone is multicultural here. I don't think, um, well maybe there were some, were there some people that were, have only, were only independent? That would be some, Dave. <laughs> Dave. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that, that's interesting. I mean, you know, it, it would, it would in, in the American culture, of course, it would tend to be more men and because, you know, and, and um, white men, absolutely, who have lived on one of the coasts or another. And so um, most people are multicultural. Most people interact with both independent and interdependent um, cultures. A lot of people are identifying with cultures that are clashing. So that means that a lot of us, at some level or another, uh, know about these divides I'm talking about and know about these irritating other people. And my point is going to be, you might want to think that it's not that person who's being irritating, but it might be that they're from uh, associated or familiar with another type of cultural context that's telling them, giving them some ideas about different ways of being. And then depending on your mix of cultural backgrounds, you're likely to use one of those selves more than the other. You will have had more practice or familiarity with it. So if you're a teacher, or you know, you're a, you're a doctor, you're an attorney, whatever, um, and you've got this well-honed independent self, the world is presenting a, uh, many, many people in many, many settings that have uh, selves that have had more practice with interdependence. And we're going to have to start figuring how to bridge those divides and to try to um, think formally about what some of those differences might be and how we might start to accommodate these differences. OK, so what I'm going to try and do now quickly is I'm going to go give you an East Asian example, and then I'm going to do um, a gender example. I'm just going to take you through the culture cycles, trying to show you just some quick examples of how you might end up wanting to save your mother as opposed to save your spouse, if you thought that was crazy. Okay. So uh, my um, understanding of a lot of how you could want to save your mother um, came from Professor Kim here in the front row, who you know loves to be pointed out and, <laughs> and called attention to. But I have to do it because when she was a graduate student at, at Stanford and we had a seminar and I wanted students to talk, like you would professors in the room, you want your students to talk, right? You have a small room, you want them to not be selfish, you don't want them to hang on to their ideas, you want them to share their ideas and connect with other people's ideas, that's only right. Do you think we could get Heejun to talk? Heejun, what do you think? Heejun stares at the <laughs> desk. Heejun, next week I'm going to call on you, and that's warm calling, no cold calling. I'm going to call on you first, so be ready with some reflections on the reading for that day. Nothing. He <laughs> doesn't work. Heejun doesn't talk. I know from P. Judd's paper that she's brilliant. I, I can see that she's taking all these interesting ideas and putting them together. But then I notice a line on her email. It says, the empty carriage rattles the loudest. Do you know what that means? No. No? <laughs> Think about it for a minute. Think about what this means. This was He Jung's way of saying that often those who have the most to say often are the ones that are the least least thoughtful or the ones you know the ones who are making the most noise the carriage that's rattling the most there's often the least going on in there this is a well-known Korean proverb and so it really 
she was telling me something. She was telling me that thinking and talking were not the same thing. And of course, for those of us who think we have to talk before we even know what we're thinking, this is, <laughs> this is a radical idea, radical idea. But it did occur to me that that could be true. So I got, got to know Hee Jung. I knew that she um, grew up in classrooms that looked a lot like this, where the students are encouraged to, looks like her, doesn't it, to sit calmly. <laughs> with, with quiet minds, the students are encouraged to pay close, close attention to teachers so that they can adjust their thinking to what the teacher is, is saying. Um, uh, they have to be aware of their place in the knowledge hierarchy. Many of you know that Asian students have a very hard time calling professors by their first name, for example, you know, because you are aware that you're low down in the knowledge hierarchy. You're, you you uh, um, give respect to your, your professor and you know less than the teacher. And the whole idea is that you don't, you, you are there to absorb knowledge. I mean, there'll be time for questioning and, and contributing, but in the beginning, you know less and you're there to, to um, take in the information and to pay attention. And when you have a well-formed comment or an idea, unless you have that, unless you're really sure, you don't, you don't put your hand up in the air. But of course, the other students in the seminar in, in Stanford grew up in classrooms that looked a lot more like this. You know what this is. You know, this is when the students are competing with each other to hone their unique ideas. They're trying to freely express their thoughts. Maybe they're trying to influence each other, or very often you know the students, they're trying to influence you as you're talking, the teacher. And in the, in the American school system, we call this critical thinking. We want students to do this. We want them to be uh, counter-arguing, debating with you as you're talking, and put, your, put their hands up and say, no, I think this, or what about this, or you're forgetting that. So these different classroom practices reflect these you know, cultural differences about what's the right way to be a person. The, in the classroom, you see inscribed these different models of agency. And also it shows up, these different ideas show up in all sorts of ways. Um, so let's see. Let's go through the culture cycle. Let me start with ideas. Very quickly, in the West, Cartesian philosophy there, Descartes. I think, therefore, I am. It couldn't be a stronger statement of, of who am I. I am what's inside me, my thoughts, what's in my head. That's who I am. That defines a person. So if that defines a person, you better get those thoughts out there so other people can hear them. Confucius, many things. Um, one of the things that he said at the beginning, the foundational principle was not his own thinking. The foundational principle for Confucius was that filial piety is the beginning of everything. Filial pi piety is respect, honoring one's parents. That, they're the beginning, so that's where you start. So that's, that's the different ideas to start with. You can begin to see why you might start to get the idea of saving your mother. Everyday um, knowledge reflects these things. In the, West, we say, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. How do I know what you're thinking? Am I supposed to read your mind? Talk to me. Tell me. In the East, yes, you should be trying to um, think about the other person and see what the person might be thinking, because there's a very different idea about making a scene of yourself. You're, you have to be aware where you fit, where you are in the hierarchy. And if you're not, the duck who makes the most noise can get shot. It's a very different idea about, about vulnerability, and, and you're vulnerable if you make a lot of noise, if you're not aware of, you know, are you the right person to ask the question? Are you the person who should be, you know, calling attention to something in this case? So it's a different idea about standing out. Um, if we move, those are at the ideas level, if you move to um, uh, institutions, media, as we talked about last week, are very important. This was a, a phone ad. Uh, I think this was the iPhone 8, a recent ad. You've got a strange effect on me, and I like it. You make my world seem bright. You make the darkness brighter, yes. So you see, she's singing about someone else, but you notice. What's the ad focusing on? They're focusing on her all by herself. You see someone come in there, and then he come in only to take a picture of her. At the same time that this ad came out, this was an ad from Korea, a Samsung ad. I don't have the video. But the whole video is these two friends taking pictures of each other, using the phone to 
um, relate to one another, and the focus is on both of them all the time. There's never a focus just on one. So at this media institution, very important for communicating these ideas of the right way to be a person, you're always seeing people in relationship adjusting to each other, not one person, as we often see. Don't take my word for it, just look at, um, sorry, look at any ads yourself. Um, now, of course, at the individual level, if you have a brain that's, walk, that's walking through this world, this Western world, that's a very different set of context that's shaping that brain, giving a form to that brain, than a brain that's in this context. Okay, so every level from what's going on, the brains, at what's happening at the interaction level, what's happening at the um, institutional level, these big ideas are different. You can begin to understand uh, why you might think differently about whether to save your mother. Um, here's a study that was done by Zhu and Xi and, and colleagues, and what you can see is that making judgments about the self or the other, you can, when you were describing uh, uh, attributes about yourself or your mother, it activates the same area of the brain for the Chinese. So mother and self judgments go, are uh, lighting up the same place. For Westerners, mother and self are in different areas of the brain. So even at, at this very individual level, personal level, there's some fuller connection overlap between mother and self for the Americans and the Chinese. Now, at the interaction level, probably one of the most famous um, examples of where there are differences was brought to us by um, Amy Chua, and she um, wrote this book, Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother, and it made a big stir, of course, and she, it was headlined in the Wall Street um, Journal as, she said, Chinese mothers are superior. And she went on to talk about why Chinese mothers were superior. It was a good thing to sell a lot of books, but she said things like this, you know, Chinese mothers don't allow their kids to attend sleepovers or be in the school play or complain about not being in the school play or you know, get any other grade less than an A, play any instrument other than the piano or violin or not play the piano or the violin. <laughs> so it was a very clear idea that this is um, what she, she called it tiger mothering. But it was, it was this um, sense that um, the children need to understand that they need to be responsive to the mother and the mother to them. And at this point, we did some research um, uh, comparing uh, Asian Americans in a uh, Cupertino, an area near uh, Palo Alto, with um, European Americans. And we first um, looked at their interdependence, and it was a scale that I showed last week. You just simply say, you know, which of these figures from two circles, self and other, um, it describes your relationship with your mother, from they're separated to they're overlapping, which you can see on the top. And the Asian Americans do say that they feel more interdependent with their mother or more overlapping with their mother than um, the European Americans do. Although from the open-ended data, all these young high school students love their mothers. Be having your mother as your best friend is something that's really happening in this cohort. Um, they're not complaining about the mothers. Um, the, it's the, um, the ones with the tiger mothers are very happy with their mothers as the um, Americans are. And so we then um, gave them uh, a, a set of very hard word puzzles, a set of anagrams, actually that weren't solvable. And at the point of failure, we then had one, or one of two conditions. Either they had to think about their mother and write about their mother, or they had to think about themselves and write about themselves. And we wanted to see what would happen to their subsequent persistence on the task. And what we found here, and the most interesting thing, I, I think, on this data is the European Americans are in blue. Thinking about your mother when you're doing, when you're failing, is not something that you want to do for European Americans. Because uh, to be an independent self, you should be figuring it out. You should drawing, be drawing from your motivation should come from inside. It shouldn't have anything to do with your mother, especially when you are a high school student. But you can see that that's not true for the Asian Americans. They did 
the best when they were thinking about their mothers. Um, they did okay when they were thinking about themselves, although not as well. But this is the, this is the cell, the idea that your mother is um, of an independent view of self is um, not the, someone that should be influencing you. Um, your motivation needs to come from the inside. At least that's the model of self that we build into our cultures. I looked then at this with very different kinds of data. Um, I was very concerned with this idea that when you have an independent model of self, an inside model of self, the idea that what's important is it's your, for, for creativity, for productivity, needs to come from you. We have this follow your passion, and you can just, anywhere you look, you find people. All of our big um, uh, cultural leaders tell us that you have to have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. You should feel the power that comes from focusing on what excites you. This is a very different idea than the fact that others who are connected with you should be pushing you or, should, or are, are, are uh, contributors to your motivation or, or are on your team. So we took um, advantage um, of a big data set, the, the PISA data set, and this is um, the, the Program for International Student Assessment. And it's uh, data that's collected on 1.2 million 15-year-olds every two years from 59 societies. And they uh, have scores in reading, math, um, and, uh, and science. And so I wanted to see this idea about, about passion. Is this truly um, important for uh, motivation, or is this more of a uh, Western phenomenon, something you would see more in individualist cultures? And what you can see here, and this is a scatter plot showing the association between individualism, this is uh, across the 59 societies and within society correlation between passion and academic achievement. And what you can see here is over here, there's the red dots, are the, those are East Asian, more collectivist countries. The correlation is much lower than it is up here with the blue dots. These are more individualist countries. The strong correlation between passion, and I didn't tell you how passion is measured, PISA includes measures of how much do you enjoy science, how, much do, um, how efficacious do you feel in it, and how interested are you. So passion was a combination of those through I interest, enjoyment, and self-efficacy. Because of course they didn't have, you know, are you passionate about it? But I think if you take those quotes from Steve Jobs and Oprah, you can say that those three things um, are very uh, good, a good uh, index um, of, of passion. So you can see this sort of general idea of something is going on for those in more collectivist worlds that achievement is not about interest and enjoyment, as Steve Jobs and Oprah say. Um, what it is remains to be seen. Um, PISA does have a couple of questions about parental support. And so this is a suggestion, and this is the, the plot between individualism and, and parental support and science performance. And you can see that parental support is related to better performance in the collectivist countries. So sort of more tiger mothering, more connection with the mother, more involvement with the mother, a more open um, uh, and welcoming view of, of others on your performance. The idea that you are part of a team and your mother's on that team is a different way of thinking. At the blue dots here, um, there. Uh, it's, a, it's a lower correlation. And there weren't as many countries that, have the, um, that had the, the, the measure of parental support, but there's about um, 40 of them here. Okay, so now why does this matter? So I'll just show you one clash. Um, this is a clash, these two different ways of being. How does it show up in our world? Why is it a divide we should care about if we assume that people who've had experience with East Asian um, cultural ideas and practices might be more likely to have an interdependent uh, way of being. And, and we're in a world that privileges and focuses the independent way. Um, you can hear, it's just one example called the bamboo ceiling. You can see that Asians are this sort of cranberry color right there. Um, they make up a good 25% of 
professionals in various um, tech companies, but their numbers are reduced when it comes to managers and very reduced when it comes to executives. And so there's something about being an executive um, in the Silicon Valley that's sort of not fitting with the common everyday way of, of operating, even though uh, more and more um, people with East Asian backgrounds are being hired in the Silicon Valley. I think it's well summed up by um, this one uh, employee who said, I didn't get the position. I was told that I didn't have the executive presence that would allow me to command the table. So commanding the table, there couldn't be a better phrase for being an independent self, right? That's what you have to do. You have to be able to say what's on your mind. You have to assert yourself. You have to, you have to say it loud. You have to be in control. You have to try and influence other people. These are all ways of being that come about from having more practice with being in independent cultural context. OK, so now I'm going to switch to, um, I did work the middle class, working class the other day, and now I'm going to switch to um, men versus women. And culture cycles of men tend to emphasize independence. Culture cycles of women tend to focus, uh, focus and emphasize interdependence. I'm going to pay a little bit of attention to STEM, because of course we're very concerned with getting more women into STEM. And what is very clear is that the culture of STEM is a masculine culture. It's a STEM culture. So if we want to get more women into STEM, we don't just have to open the door. We have to think about the STEM culture and how we're going to change it so it reflects more of what women tend to have had more practice with, and that's interdependence. You know, you might say to me, oh, come on, is that still really true? I mean, here's just a few studies. High school boys rate their math abilities higher than do girls with the same grades. Men overestimate their contributions to work teams, while women underestimate their contributions. Male STEM faculty perceive less gender bias and see it as less of an obstacle than do women. A uh, recent study that shows that uh, male STEM faculty tend to have fixed mindsets. They tend to believe that you either have it for math or you don't. Um, the women STEM faculty don't believe that. Um, here's some other findings, uh, recent findings. Men interrupt more. Um, they talk more and longer turns, talking turns. They make fewer connections to other speakers. They remember fewer details from others' turns. They attribute women's contributions to other men. Women. This is all, all evidence-powered here, no, no, no editorializing. Um, women are less comfortable talking about their strengths, self-promotion. They, they ask for less and settle sooner in negotiations. They worry more about jeopardizing social bonds. And to top it off, they get more backlash when they do ask for more because, and they assert their opinions, because then they're accused of being immodest because you know being independent is not something you can do. I just had thrown one of my favorite cartoons here, which is, uh, it says, um, you can see one woman, one, all the men. That's an excellent suggestion, Miss Triggs. Perhaps one of the men here would like to make it. So <laughs> it's, you know, it's just, OK. Culture cycle of men and women. What, what are some of the things that produce these differences? Let's start at the ideas level. Google scientist. Just Google images scientist. This is what you get. Here's another one. You know, it is just, it's still, we're working, we're trying to get more women into STEM, we're trying to change the culture, but you know, just um, when you look at who, science equals what? Science equals men. Now, of course, this science equals men is just a reflection of our larger culture. The people who are doing the influencing and the controlling over there on the left tend to be men the ones that are making things happen. The people who are doing the caring and the relating and the connecting um, and the being aware of other people and taking time to see what they think tend to be women over here on the right-hand side. So it's not really very um, surprising why we have this bias also in STEM. Within STEM, there's lots of specific institutions that foster independence and make it difficult to do the changing. Career expectations interfere with family and community. That tends to hit women harder than men because women do the family stuff. Um, service is disproportionately assigned to women. Service and teaching are valued less than research. And interdependent STEM 
women leaders in STEM are for the most part still lacking. At the interactions level, you can look at everyday, at everyday media. Um, mass media are really great cultural products, they have very clear um, messages they send us all the time about how to be women. Researchers sh are showing again and again, even in the most recent children's media, that the hero still of what our, our kids are um, taking in is usually male. And still the story is still focusing on men leading, standing out, taking control, being unique, and saving the world. And girls, by contrast, are still busy getting saved, um, which apparently in many cases is a full-time job. And they're helping with the nurturing, and they're, they're supporting men and women. And it, it, when female characters are strong, even to this day, they're still cast as villains and witches. It's just amazing. The data are really important because you can have the feeling that there's all these inspired people out there that are changing everything. But when you actually do the analysis of the cultural products, it's not really making a big impact on, on culture yet. Um, you know, you still, from Sleeping Beauty to decades of Bond girls, you know, scantily cad girls, the women are usually hanging around on the orbits of the plot. They're really not making things happen yet. So no, no surprise why we've got a male culture um, in STEM. This is an um, old study recently replicated. Um, how quickly would you pick up this 16-week-old baby named Jonathan who's crying? Okay. <laughs> Jonathan. How about this baby? Andrea. Turns out it's the same baby. <laughs> but but men are much um, slower to pick up the, well, first of all, I should say that women are much slower to pick up Jonathan than they are Andrea. So this is women. And they, they, think it's, they think it's a male or a female. So the women was Jonathan, you know, already the independent model of how to be is in place. They're thinking, oh, it'll be okay if he cries a little bit, you know. But when it's Andrea, then they go more quickly. The important thing to know is that men are equally slow to pick up either Jonathan or Andrea, which doesn't <laughs> surprise us. But the important thing I wanted you to recognize is that the women from the beginning, from 16 weeks old, women themselves, who many who are very surprised by these results because they, you know, are not, they don't want to impose these um, views on their young daughters are still, are still doing this. Okay, STEM interactions. Lots of STEM interactions that foster independence in STEM. There's focus grading on the curve, weeding out, all kinds of zero-sum competitions are still very common in STEM classes. Attributions of genius and failure. It, success comes from genius, failure comes from being, you know, not having the right stuff, being um, mediocre, without talking about effort or social support. Um, argumentative style of discourse is still very common in, in STEM classes and still portrayals of successful researchers as geeks who don't value or respond effectively to the feelings or opinions of others, and actually thinking that this is, you know, this is really good. Okay, so I wanna get now to how we're gonna bridge the gender divide. And I think that, first of all, we have to start with men using more independence. Why do I start that way? Because as you noticed on the chart that you filled out, on the right-hand side, all those cultural contexts in red, those are the relatively low power contexts. The ones in blue are the relatively high power contexts. So when anything has to change, the people with high power have to start it. They've got the goods, they've got the resources. So men should start making understanding and accommodating more to inter inter interdependence. And women, for their part, should you know think about using more independence as well, but I think it needs to start with those in the high power positions being aware of interdependence and making a place for it. Um, what can be done for bridging the gender divide? And this I'm going to talk some today and then more next week. Hire and promoting more women. That's obvious. They can make these spaces much less masculine and much less independent. Um, and they can represent women in artifacts. This was a study that was done recently by um, Latu and Mast, where they had men and women give speeches in front of a big theater-style auditorium. At the back of the auditorium, there was either a picture of a powerful woman, and this was before, uh, this was before the recent um, <laughs> election, um, 
there was a picture of Hillary Clinton at the back. There was a picture of Angela Merkel in the back. There was a picture of Bill Clinton in the back, or there was no, no poster at all. And what they found is that the women, and this was done in Switzerland, the women gave better speeches and longer speeches when there was a picture of a powerful woman in the back of the auditorium, and the better speeches were rated, uh, uh, that was rated by an independent set of coders. They were also longer than when Bill Clinton was in the poster in the back or when there was nobody in the back. So, you know, just, just, just an image of, of another woman made a difference. Um, this is something that we're all used to seeing in many of our universities, these walls of fame here, men, men. They're everywhere, and we just think, well, you know, that's part of it. Very often, these are the seminar rooms that we spend a huge amount of time in. And so there was an early study by Kundiff and her colleagues, and now um, uh, Septa Coopta and one of her students has been um, replicated this and finds that male-dominated walls of fame, which are most walls of fame wherever we go in our universities, they reduce belonging among women and students of color, they impaired performance on an evaluative task, and they reduced interest and motivation to pursue the various academic um, disciplines. They did this in, the, in various settings with different walls of fame. It's sort of not, um, not surprising. At the individual level, what can we do? I started off showing you the data on women and men talking. One easy way to start fostering interdependence is to listen to women. It's not really hard to do. Uh, you can make sure that there's plenty of women at the table. That's a start, because if you're going to listen to them, they got to be there. You can require people to speak some minimum number of times or to go around. This is in your lab settings or wherever you are. No interruptions, because men tend to do more of the interrupting while they're expressing their ideas that they're passionate about that they just have to get off their chest. Um, and then after a woman talks, it's very important to get people to practice connecting what she said with what you're going to say. So make, forming those connections is something that women tend to do for each other. There's lots of data on that. Um, men don't do that. They, they um, start from wherever they've been thinking about. Okay, so those are all examples of differential treatment. So we have to make sure that in our spaces, we're not doing differential treatment. We're not making things, we're not allowing for more independence and less interdependence, more masculine and less feminine ways of doing things. And so those were some examples of how to make sure we don't have um, differential treatment because you know that's what we would call sexism. That's, and I've been working um, this with a subnaturian um, in a uh, paper that we've done. So differential treatment is this. The door is open for the man, right? So he can just walk right in. The door is closed for the woman. That's differential treatment. So we, those examples I just gave you are some ideas to make sure we're not, we don't have differential treatment. But one of the really, really big problems is what we're calling um, masculine defaults. So masculine default is like the door is now open for both men and women. So it's not differential treatment. Come on in, come into the university, come into the lab, come into our group, let me hire you, let me sit at, you at the table. But what you see is that the way the institution that you're being allowed into is, is structured, is structured still through the male way of being, which is still the independent way of being. Here's a definition of masculine default. These are cultural features or practices that are not manifestly gendered on the surface, but which value, reward, and make normative characteristics and behaviors that are typically associated with men. So it looks like it's something that's pretty neutral. I mean, and so I'll give you some examples. Um, I'll do these quickly. Uh, let's start with the one in the middle. Really nice study on gender neutral tenure clock. So this is the idea that men and women both get time off to, for having a baby or um, whenever there's a baby in the family, they get the time off, the same amount of time. So this is a group of economists that followed what happened to um, men and women as they took time off. The idea was this should help women and um, uh, to um, improve in their rates of tenure. And what they found is, and this is gender neutral, it looked like, a, it looked like one of these you know, things that would, that would work. What they found is the rate of tenure for women decreased because it's obvious, right? The men 
use their year off to write their papers. And the women, because t things are typically, st are still organized the way they're typically organized, are doing most of the childcare. So this was something that looked like, how much more fair could you be? Men and women both get, both get time off. So that was what we call a masculine default because it didn't recognize the way the culture was set up. Um, this is another very important one on brilliance. Most people say, look, I don't care if they're, if they're men, if they're women, I don't care what they are. I, just give me the best and brightest. I want the really brilliant people in my lab. And you say that and you think, ah, see, none of this, you know, I'm not, I don't care about gender, ethnicity, race, any of those things. I just want, I just want brilliance. And you think you're safe, right? Well, let's think about what brilliance is. When we say brilliant, and this is empirical testing, who comes to mind? Einstein. Okay, Einstein. What's Einstein? Well, doesn't comb his hair, works by himself, works on, on his own project, not what, not what others are doing, isn't influenced by others, doesn't really connect with others or, or is, is, isn't concerned with others, works at his own pace, not part of a team. So if that's the definition of brilliance, which is a very masculine definition, it's much closer to ways of being male than it is to being female, saying that you just want the best and the most brilliant for your team is building the masculine default right into what you're doing. So whenever you say, I just want the best and the brightest, you have to stop and ask yourself, okay, what's my, what's my definition of what's, of what's the brightest? Um, Einstein, risk taking, for example. Well, women take risks all the time, but if you look at risk taking questionnaires, risk taking gets defined as, you know, going solo down the cliff at Yosemite. You know, well, that, that's one kind of risk. But there are many other risks in the world. But you have to think of what are the underpinning um, meanings. And then finally, self-promotion is another masculine default. We like um, people in an independent culture that say what's on their mind, that express their ideas. We talked about that from the very beginning when I was complaining about Heejung. But self-promotion is another masculine default because we're saying that the, the way to get hired, the way to get promoted, is to behave in this very independent way. And so we reward that and we look for it and then that builds this masculine default into our system. So why does this matter? Now, I started with telling you that there's an independence bias in our cultures and in our, um, our social sciences. The majority of people in the world, including most US Americans, as I told you last week, have more practice and familiarity with an interdependent model of self. Because we are a working class nation, 68% of Americans don't have a college education. They're much more familiar in those contexts in which they live with an interdependent way of being. So even right here at home, interdependence is much more on the ground than it is in these settings like this. Psychological science misunderstands and mischaracterizes human behavior. Our theories are far, far from comprehensive because we don't understand what more than half of the world is all about. Here's just some examples of interdependence-related concepts that we are very, very weak on in our social science. You know, we, we do relationships, but we really, we've barely started at loyalty, adjustment, coping, respect, di dignity, hierarchy, conformity, obligation, duty, adherence to norms, we don't know anything about adherence to norms. Norms regulate all our behavior if we don't study it because we don't like the idea as Americans that other people are making us do stuff. Trust, resilience, helping, sharing, status, power, solidarity, all of these things, just whole huge areas of behavior that we um, are really weak on because we have this independence bias. So we don't develop necessary tools and methods to assess interdependence. Like in the, in the PISA data, I had to scrap up a few items on parental support to sort of get a, some handle on interdependence. Our interventions, which we have to intervene in all sorts of huge social problems, are much less effective than they would be. Um, uh, he Jung, for example, has done very important work, and David, um, on uh, you know, getting people to care more about their environment. Well, you know, we have to care. How do you get people to care about their environment? Who's most likely to care about it? We need to know this. And the interdependent way of being that's afforded by resources and power, all those blue cultural contexts are the ones with the power, um, those ways of being tend to occlude and often ignore 
the interdependent ways, and we, m most importantly, we tend to denigrate them in various ways and often penalize them in lots of ways. So I'll talk about that next week. So how to bridge divides. Don't assume the other person is bad. <laughs> Instead, at least as a first thought, assume that you're experiencing a culture clash, something that you don't understand. And since independence is the current cultural default, cultural balancing is needed. By that I mean we need to identify and dismantle features that are privileging independence. If we don't need that independence, then let's think about could we, could we get rid of that and put something else in its place? Or, and, could we add cultural features that are inscribing more interdependent ways of being into our various settings? And I think you know, we can do that throughout the culture cycle, and that's what I'm going to talk about on uh, Monday, some various experiments with doing that. And at that, I'll stop and thank you for your patience. And I want to thank you for, to my many, many collaborators on this work. Thank you. I'm happy for your questions. Question. So uh, it's my role to be evil. Uh, so oh, oh, yeah, hi. <laughs> See where you're talking about. Yes, hi. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so you could make an argument uh, that so uh, genders have been evolving independently for 80 million years mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. more likely 600 million years and especially in mammals mm -hmm. with uh, there's been a long sort of unitary evolution of extreme maternal care uh, whereas uh, in males, uh, our nearest male relatives do no uh, parental care. Mm -hmm. And so there has been uh, the rise of a strong paternal psychology that's fairly evolutionarily recent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's no reason to expect, and I don't think you would expect, that uh, these two would be identical and only cultural treatment would make them different, right? No. So no. then, given that, uh, then uh, you could see that some of how people are thinking about this is because men and women interact differently in the workplace and evolutionarily intense zero-sum competition has been more of a problem that the male design has been, uh, you know, uh, selected to face and interdependence mm -hmm. and uh, a social core mm -hmm. where you're pretty much always with others and so on is a sort of female thing then female interdependence and male independence people have values and pe their values might plausibly in part arise from uh, these prior gendered uh, uh, things and so why is it Maybe women are winning by trading off more for interdependence and home life. And why should it be a, uh, what is the abstract position from which justice involves dragging women into uh, more competitive, non-interdependent, or trying to reshape yeah. okay. uh, the psychologies of males and females? Well, for one thing, I don't think that, I, I don't have any argument with evolution. You know, we are evolutionarily derived beings. We are biological beings. My point is we are also cultural beings. And that's sort of my argument is to pay much more attention to culture than we have as, as a field. So I think that if our cultures, which change very, very quickly, if we women, we as a culture, decide that we want to do less of that and more of something else, we can set up worlds that will encourage that, that will foster that. And at least for those women and those families who want to do it, I think um, it's, it's happening in, in lots of places. Will there be more problems? You might predict it's not gonna, it'll only happen quickly for, for some people in some contexts, um, certainly people with resources whenever you're gonna get ready to change cultures. Resources help, um, but I think, but I think it is happening. I mean, for me, I was in Japan recently. You never saw men with babies. 
now it's become the fashion in Japan for the men to wear the baby carriers and to be the kind of walking around carrying the babies, feeding the babies out in public, things that just seemed like impossible 10 years ago. So, you know, what that will lead to, maybe they go home and just, you know, throw the baby in the corner and when no one can see them and they're not. I, I, I'm just saying I think that the cultural change is, is, is happening and if we build worlds that foster it, it, we can, you know, it can happen more quickly. I don't argue that there hasn't been, there is an evolutionary history to this. Of course there is. No, I'm not saying that you're denying that. I'm saying that given that men and women are different, what is the neutral point from which, so, so for example, I don't know what it is, something like 90%, 95% of outdoor jobs are carried out by men, okay? And so should there be extreme effort uh, in making sure that the jobs are of being a solitary person out in the, you know, digging, uh, you know, uh, sewage things in the middle of a storm, that that's done 50% by women, and therefore to reconceptualize the job in a way that that's more acceptable to women. Well, maybe, I think if we can get the robots to do that, you know, <laughs> so we're all concerned in Silicon Valley with, you know, the robots are gonna take all the jobs, so maybe we, maybe we can do that, and I guess I think if the women wanna do it, they should be able to do it. I'm not, I'm not gonna mandate, um, so this is the last thing I'll say, but yeah. yes, so you just brought in choice and voluntariness, right? And so, and obviously who could be opposed to that? But oh, I'm just saying that, that, that looking, looking at something, uh, looking at something and saying there's something wrong here presupposes there is a kind of neutral standpoint from which one can see. No, yeah, yeah no, that's, that, that's a really good point and that, and that I'm trying to, um, Produce more equality is a very Western phenomenon. That's another. That's another talk. But, you know, who is it that's concerned with equality and and rooting out inequality and fostering inequality? You know, I do that from a very American standpoint. I mean, in, if I give this talk in Japan or or Korea, um, people will ask, you know, why why is this your issue? Why is this your main issue? Because there's much more understanding that the world is hierarchical and equality is, you know, not the foundation of everything. So, yeah, I take your point. There's a lot to discuss. Uh, yes, back there, Rami. Is there some uh, social exclusion or ostracism or any social cost for men and women who deviate from the cultural cycles of independence and interdependence with which they're associated? I think John would say yes, and I think I would say yes, because even though we're trying to change uh, norms, I mean, if that's our, our, our goal, it's still, it's still set up for one way of being, and so things are not gonna go that smoothly. I mean, it could be, what I think is the people who are aware, we, I was sh asking for a show of hands of people who had balance of independence or independence. I think those are resources, those are assets, those are gonna allow people to have you know, more tools for negotiating their multicultural world than other people, so I think it could be a benefit. But it could also, it can also be a cost. I mean, the, uh, the data are very clear for women at the highest levels of management and positions of CEO. Um, Typically, those, the higher up you go in the hierarchy, the better your health because you have more resources, you have everything. For women, that's not the case. At the high levels, they're sick because they're fighting, I think, against a, a, you know, masculine defaults of various types. Um, I noticed on your chart that you listed the South and the Midwest as being more interdependent mm -hmm. in their culture, mm -hmm. but they vote just the opposite. They vote against public assistance and things like that. Well, you know, the reason I didn't have um, blue versus red on here or conservative versus liberal, we were talking about this in Heejung's lab today, is because it, it's, that's kind of complicated. It doesn't really fall out as you might um, imagine that there would be um, more interdependence, would vote more um, for more government regulation. It, you know, it, and it depends because n none of us are monocultural, so your regional culture overlaps with your class culture, with your, with your gender culture, with your, you know, your race culture. There's many other factors that come into play. It's a, it's a good question. You can't, you know, everybody's trying to understand the, 
the red blue. We don't have that one wired yet. Yeah, maybe one last question. Yeah. No, Hillary's. Yes, Hillary's. Yes. For women. Bill Cl yeah, Bill Clinton. So it was Hillary or uh, Merkel gave women gave longer speeches when there was a powerful woman than the picture of when Bill was in the back or when there was no picture. It didn't matter for men. They weren't respond they didn't even notice there's a poster back there. Yes. Well, I think, I mean, I think it was a good study because it did try to have people who were at least, you know, good speakers. I mean, after all, they're politicians, so they know how to speak. I mean, we could talk about the eloquence of Hillary versus Bill. Uh, okay, <laughs> yeah, but, but, but yeah, I mean, it was a fairly well controlled. Yes, in the back. Thank you. Thank you. What's you know, you know what I said? We have to, um, the men have to open the door so maybe they should not talk. And then you, and then I said, then, but then, but then I said, you women have to use your independent selves. You have to put your hand in the air and stop talking. Whether you have something, okay, here's another woman who's going to talk. Let's have two women talk. We have two minutes. Well, I think it's really that's it's really that's why I started with Yijung. It's not easy, but I think you need to find um, multiple ways for people to participate. I mean, Yijung's um, groundbreaking um, dissertation, where she, you know she went on to show that actually talking gets in the way of thinking for Asian Americans. Um, talking helps thinking for Americans. I mean, the people th the that's not their best way to think when they're in the spotlight. So having reaction papers, which you then read and say, I noticed that you know you made this point, and then giving people a chance to fill in if they want to, or just expressing their point to the class from what you've read from the person. Um, getting people, um, organizing your class by groups that meet together and groups that get to know each other. Because when people are comfortable in a group and they know the others and form a relations, then they can usually talk very well in those, in those groups. I mean, if you look at, it's like, you know, if you look at, Asian students together, there's no lack of conversation. It's just as much noise going on when people are talking to each other as a group of white students talking to each other. But it's, it's the context that makes all the difference. That was a famous point that Eleanor Maccabee made about men and women. When you put women in a room and men in a room, get them to do tasks, there's no difference in how they perform on anything. Put them together, and all of a sudden you start seeing all these gender differences because people are doing their roles. But it's a really good question, and I think if you send me an email, I have a whole nice list of exact, specific suggestions of things to do that I, that I think we can change the, the culture if we want to, for those who want it to be changed for them. Yes. Thank you. And you had one more? Yeah, go ahead. Standing in for women. Go ahead. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a re it's a really good question, and I think by s 
starting the conversation like you're doing and starting, you know, people are always afraid of wasting class time because got to get to the content, got to get to the content, taking some amount of class time, whatever the content of the class, and talking about what are going to be our class norms. Everybody's here because they're brilliant, they're in college, they want to study this. How are we going to make sure that we make a, a thriving multicultural space so that everybody has a chance to contribute? How do you like to contribute? How do you not like to contribute? Set that up. Get people talking. Bring it up. It could take, you could waste one whole hour on it. It would be really, it would be really worth it. I also think that talking about masculine defaults, the reason I like that term is it's a better term than male privilege. No one likes male privilege. No one, because you, every, nobody feels like they're privileged. You know, we all feel like we're like worker bees. We're like just killing ourselves. We don't, where's my privilege, you know? But other people can point it out. So I don't, I don't like that term. But if you just try and show that there's certain ways of doing things that are built into the bricks that we could do differently and then, you know, have women talk about this, it really can make a huge difference in a short amount of time. But that's what I ended with, you know, listening to women. Got to make space for them to talk and, and then let women talk. Thank you for your question. Thank you.